I'm Ricardo, and as mentioned, we're going to talk about the requirements to modern semantic search engines in this talk. So the question is, why do we need to talk about that anymore? Because we have the big players on the market, right? Everybody of you is probably using them and probably use them already today. But we were more focusing on enterprise data and industrial applications. So because you know all probably one or of these pictures or a similar one, the web is growing. I don't need to tell that. We get a lot of data per second. Even per 60 seconds, we have more than 88,000 Skype calls and so on. And if you are in industry 4.0, which is the new buzzword, or smart data, you know that these numbers apply also to industrial data. Supply chains, uh, chains are growing, as well as logistics and so on. So our partners actually came to us and asked us, can you build a search engine that is capable of uh, dealing with large enterprise data. I don't want to say big data in that particular case because it's more heterogeneous than normal big data applications. And we said, sure. And we went forward and actually asked ourselves, how can, can we build that and what do we have to uh, look out for? So our requirements at Licitation basically had five phases. The first phase is, well, we talked with each other and we looked at the expected state of the art. There's a big fuss currently about data being the new oil. I think that is true, but in particular, at least according to media, we have four big problems um, with data. And we wanted to clarify for ourselves, are they there or not? The first problem is growing amount of data. I think that's true, we don't have to speak about that. The other thing is we have a heterogeneous software solution landscape. So if you go to enterprises and look into their software landscape, they have one tool to extract data from HTML pages. They have another tool to watch their Twitter account so that their product uh, feedback is well monitored. Then they have SAP, CRM systems, and so on. The third big problem is basically that we have data lakes. Those data lakes are basically isolated databases or data sources across different company uh, subsidiaries. So imagine a company with more than one location. They need somehow to exchange their data or even across uh, departments like the marketing department and the human resources department need to exchange their data or search across it. The third or the fourth point is that, well, we are in the semantic web community and what blows uh, against us is all the time that RDF has a high uh, entrance barrier. So we, the basic thing that we uh, hear from companies is basically that users and developers do not understand what we are talking about. But we all know that RDF is basically uh, the way to go if you want to uh, solve data lake issue problem and the heterogeneous data problem. So what, what is the state of the art in semantic search apart from Google? We are talking now about enterprise data. Well, we rarely see hybrid data source solutions that is we rarely see out there that one query can actually go over different data silos and retrieve data from there. We also see, at least in research, that most semantic search applications are not scalable or ineffective, i.e. have a low quality. We see that there's either work on personalization or on policy. You can have a search engine that actually looks into your browser and adapts the ranking of search results according to your search history, but you can't have at the same time a policy enforcement like um, you would see in an LDAP environment or Active Directory environment where only certain users can access certain data. And you have a poor support of semantics. That is, longer complex queries are only dealt with keywords. And if those keywords do not appear because you have uh, homonyms or synonyms, you will rarely find what you are looking for. So our goal is we want to have an open source semantic search engine tackling all those problems, or at least we think we need to develop one to tackle those problems. Because we have three use cases in one of our partner projects that I'm going to introduce now. And in those uh, use cases, we have, for one, an academic use case, where we want to query encyclopedic knowledge, like from the Wikipedia, i.e. full text knowledge, at the same time with semantics behind, beyond that. So we want to efficiently retrieve hybrid information as well as uh, complex information based on keyword levels because still users are used because Google teached us over or taught us over years and years that we have to use keywords and not natural language. We don't 
normal users just don't ask Google things in full sentences. Or am I right? So, and the third thing that use case demands is actually to federate over several sources like the World Health Organization to answer questions pertaining to medical data, pertaining to industrial data, pertaining to car data, for example. We have this whole lot cloud that we need to query in that use case. The second use case deals with Wikidata. Wikidata is quite similar to Wikipedia, but Wikidata has provenance data based on structured feedback. So actually Wikidata sees himself as a hub for all the Wikimedia projects. And a partner came to us and asked us, can you please do enterprise search on that? Because we can use Wikidata um, to integrate existing enterprise data silos into our environment. So identifying different records on different data silos and data likes with Wikidata makes it easier to actually link and search those data uh, repositories. Yeah, and the uh, third thing, which is very important for enterprises and a take home note is basically that Wikidata is a curated enterprise knowledge graph as mentioned in the keynote. So it's very valuable for enterprises nowadays. And the third thing is basically, um, the third partner came to us and wanted to have an enterprise search as a single query point. This is not his actual data landscape, but you can imagine that now companies nowadays really look like that. And he wanted to have an extraction of knowledge graph from all data sources, i.e. he had a, a landscape where he had a proprietary, a proprietary formats like Excel, Word, PDF, and so on, as well as um, <coughs> enterprise uh, software solutions like ERP and CRM systems, which he wanted to query just via the search slip. So having those three use cases, it's actually um, now the time to ask yourself, hmm, how do I retrieve the specifications to engineer or to develop and implement a modern semantic search engine? Therefore, we had for each use case, because each use case is so diverse, an elicitation strategy. For the first case, um, the querying DBP use case, as it is academic, we went to academic requirements, that is, I want to introduce you to the world of question answering and keyword search benchmarks. We have two big initiatives out there. One is made by a German guys, Christina Unger et al. at the University of Bielefeld, which is the QALD um, challenge. This challenge has been taking place uh, for the sixth time now at major conferences. And what we see is that over the last years, keyword search as well as natural language search actually improved from 0.2 F measure to 0.9 F measure. That is, now we have actually algorithms that can understand that, but it's centered on eBpedia most of, the, most of the times. The other big challenge is the OKBQA challenge, where Axel Monga and uh, Kison Choi from the KAIS in Korea are actually developing an open question answering system, which is able to um, answer not only encyclopedic questions, but also Jeopardy questions. And as you remember, in 2011, IBM Watson actually beat uh, the, the winner of the Jeopardy uh, challenge. This is going to happen next week with open source software in Korea, where uh, the OKBQA project together with the Exoprain project try to uh, beat the Korean champion in Jeopardy. And well, let's, let's be surprised how that turns out. And this Exoprain project actually uh, inspects knowledge bases like Wikipedia but also goes to the web if it finds for one particular question not the answer it searched for. And so our elicitation strategy basically said three major points. We went to them and asked them, what will you do? And they said, well, you have to analyze existing systems and existing components and you have to use our benchmarks as well as um, outdated benchmarks like Leto and Squat, which were done until 2011, until Peter Mika went to Yahoo but then afterward nobody uh, maintained it anymore. And this is one of the major problems we have in our research field. Benchmarks which get outdated and not updated anymore and are not just representative anymore for the state of the art. And this hinders actually our research most, in my opinion. The second uh, elicitation strategy based on Wikipedia, Wikipedia, uh, Wikidata, sorry, no, um, is that we went to the uh, community of Wikidata and asked them, what would you expect from a search engine? Our big plus is that Metafax, also a sponsor of the conference, um, is uh, the maintainer of the Wikidata query service, running millions of queries a month. 
And we are also actively engaged in the Wikidata mailing list. So we retrieved uh, all the data or all the insights that we could get from the Wikidata mailing list to curate our idea of a semantic search engine. And the third thing was um, this enterprise partner who wanted to do uh, one search engine, but for four different application domains at the same time. As this is really, really hard, he had to do a lot of more elicitation than the other um, use cases. For the first thing, he actually um, did informal interviews with the Swiss uh, company. That is, he basically uh, summarized from protocols that he had made what this company wanted. The second thing is, he, he did formal interviews. That is, he went to an engineering company and asked each of those engineers, what do you want to uh, see in the semantic search engine? Those were uh, contractors for rotating machines and had a lot of databases of um, non-semantic, basically, machine descriptions that they wanted to search through. The third thing was a formal interview with a uh, German partner company together to uh, get an idea of what the large Swiss bank actually wants to know. And this large Swiss, uh, Swiss bank is actually interested in fintech and wants to search the web as well as different data streams uh, to analyze how the market is moving. And the fourth thing is we did a public survey, which is still online, and I encourage you to go to that URL or click it on the slides, which I will upload afterwards, to actually participate there. We had 13 uh, quality responses uh, on that uh, survey from big companies, small companies, as well as NGOs, which wanted to see um, basically uh, one search engine for all their use cases. So as you see, the, the landscape of requirements is really large. We have uh, many, many use cases. As the online survey goes on, we, still, we will have more and more requirements and we try to fit them all together. And our idea is basically to use semantics, RDF and W3C standards. What that means in detail is that Wikipedia said, well, we want to cover the whole linked data lifecycle. I hope all of you know the picture by Zoran Auer from the LOD2 project, which basically describes how data evolves throughout its life, from being uh, discovered, extracted, interlinked, fused, quality ma uh, maintained, and then stored. That is, for, especially in that use case, people wanted to see that we are able to work on CSV and XML, what the big vendors don't do right now, at least for uh, the public. In industry, CSV and XML is a quite common format, so we are well prepared for that. But then they said they want to large-scale Sparkle Query Federation, i.e. I, they, they wanted to be able to Sparkle the whole linked open data cloud, which has more than 3,000 Sparkle endpoints in one single query. And if possible, with, within three seconds, which is a good requirement, but hard to engineer. The fourth thing is that they wanted precision over recall so that they can make trusted decisions. They don't care whether we find all, for example, cars which, uh, which are blue and have five seats, but they want that all cars that we retrieve are exactly that. And the fourth or fifth thing is that we want to have a verbalizing, verbalization of answers, that is, most semantic web approaches, if you go to uh, search engines like Xena, Yoda, and so on, they will present you a list of 10 blue links. And those 10 blue links are very bad for people in general, humans, to read. So we want to verbalize those answers using the data at hand. For the Wikidata use case powered by Metafax, we basically wanted an interface between this existing great open source uh, community of Wikidata and enterprise knowledge graphs. So the requirements here were that they wanted to link those data sources together with Wikidata identifiers and have a rich keyword search over not only the Wikidata and their enterprise things, but also an Elasticsearch index deployed across all their data sources. And which was not surprising, they wanted multilingual support. And we said, sure, we can give you multilingual support in the major uh, languages, that's no problem. But then they said, no, no, we have data in, in English, German, and so on there. And if you query in French, we want that you find also the German data, which was Surprising, but well, we have to deal with that now. So um, for the third use case, we actually had to look at different aspects of it because it's a, such a large, large use case. They wanted knowledge sources um, to be available from PDFs, emails, calendars, and so on. So all the proprietary formats that you 
probably will find in company uh, environments, as well as search in wikis and blogs uh, on the web. So they not only wanted to have structured data or at least semi-structured data, they also wanted to have an understanding of full texts and connect with their already existing products. For search, they actually wanted to have a common vocabulary. That is, um, if I search for a birthplace of a person, it doesn't matter in which language or how it's expressed. The, the important thing is they wanted to have a homonym or a synonym-like uh, vocabulary maintained by us so they can search whatever they want and find it. The, the really surprising thing is that uh, the influence of the big players led to uh, the development of an understanding that a search is no more than a search slip. They don't want the drop-down menus or, or forms or something. They just want a search slip with autocompletion, just Google-like. And so you see what uh, the big players, or how the big players influenced also research and these, as well as policy enforcement. And for the pr result presentation, again, they wanted filtering capabilities, i.e. they wanted uh, to, um, that the search list basically can uh, be looked at in a facetted way, a facetted search, like the JASA framework does that, and to want uh, to integrate different results using widgets so that they can adapt the product for the customers they attend. Having those requirements, now, from the different use cases, we need to shrink it down and make it and coalesce it so that we have one system design. The system design is basically these. So, from all those requirements, in total, there were more than 60 formal requirements, which you can look up in the paper. We came up with that simple architecture, which is modular and speaks with web interfaces with each other. So, all those web interfaces basically um, are decoupled so that you can have more than one generation module and several extraction modules, but they all talk in the same language with each other. From top to bottom, or from bottom to top, we have an RDF-based knowledge extraction layer, which will be able to uh, support open data and proprietary formats, because all the formats can, will be transfer, uh, translated to RDF and supports multilingual search. We will have to do a search engine, which will focus on precision over recall, which is a new point to us which haven't been up in research recently, so although uh, those F-measure comparisons are actually useless in our case, because we have to focus on precision here, and we will implement a did you mean feature just to be more Google-like. The fourth thing is, or well, the third thing is that we will enable search over distributed data so that we can cope with those data silos. This is, we will use a query federation with an enrolled policy execution layer to ensure that we can, uh, each user does only use the data that he has access to or is allowed to use in his search query. As well as some other use case specific criteria which I'm not going to detail. The actual finding is that most of the technologies or many of the technologies can be found at aksw.org, i.e. at our research group already. They just have to be plugged together. Moreover, what we find is that the open source landscape is actually capable of providing enterprise data search. However, they are distributed among the open source community and there is not one solution at all. Um, having said that, you actually need to uh, measure how good you are. And uh, next to those very vague points of uh, requirements, we actually had um, specifications from the users that they wanted to see, like a query execution time of 50 milliseconds, or that they wanted to have an F-measure or a precision of a certain quality based on the knowledge extraction phase. So we asked ourselves, well, we have now those more than 20 KPIs which are quantitative and not qualitative, and how do we measure that? And fortunately, there's the Hobbit project maintained by or led by Axel Gonga, which is the holistic benchmarking platform of big link data, which I want to uh, yeah, present to you. And I would suggest that you visit the website because that's a Horizon 2020 project that just started, which is able to actually benchmark everything as long as you can write a module for it on our personal servers back at the University of Leipzig. And the big plus point of the Hobbit platform is that for each experiment that you run, you will get a URL, and this URL is basically RDF-ized and will be stable for a long time by our W3ID standards. That is, all your research data and all your comparisons will be, will be stored forever and will be comparable across versions of your dataset and so on. 
And where do we to be going to implement it? Well, there's a diesel project. The diesel project is basically um, the project why we are doing this. Um, for the, the, the actual kick uh, starting moment that we are doing this together with the University of Leipzig, the Metafix uh, uh, company, and the Ontas IG from Switzerland, where we had 36 months to implement that vision. In conclusion, um, I hope I, sorry, I hope I uh, could present you a concise requirement specification, i.e. present you a requirement specification driven by use cases. Um, I could hopefully give you a sense of how user-driven uh, key performance indicators look like nowadays and why we are not there yet with the search engines at hand. And I want to invite you to join the ongoing requirements elicitation process and to stay tuned for the first prototypes of Diesel and Hobbit, which will be out this month, or at least in three months' time from now on for the Diesel case. So thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Exactly. So my question is, uh, I believe that you put those apps, apps for because other people in the dorm will use them. Exactly. And why did they do that? They do that because basically all researchers based on apps scores. If you only publish a paper saying, that is my precision, you will not get uh, to the conference, right? So people <coughs> publish app scores but are aware that precision is the thing that they are actually interested in a real context. And that's the same thing that we heard in the keynote. Um, because we live or most people think they live in a closed world, they can give you a F score. But in the real world, where there is the web and we have an open world assumption, we actually cannot calculate an F score at all. Right. On the other hand, you cannot rely on the precision itself because you know, that is trivial to maximize if you ignore the other parts of the error. That's true. The, the, the S, so from our point of view, there has to be something like an F measure at 10 or something so that you can actually go to the user and ask them, do you think that those 10 results are worth to you? Mm -hmm. well, that's one big part of, of the Hobbit platform to actually find KPIs that are measurable mm -hmm. and not only uh, use what we used for the last 20 years. Are there any more questions? So, uh, just being curious, I'm not from the semantic web uh, practice, but uh, so, so you build a new semantic search engine. So exactly. what, again, is uh, the most uh, important disadvantage uh, of the current uh, solutions? They don't what understand the user. They don't understand the search intent. People use natural language, which is the most complex uh, way of expressing an information need. And only by trans by using keywords, we lose a lot of complex relations within a natural language question. So by enabling an, a machine to actually understand and ground the semantics of a natural language input, we can then do better search. Okay. If there are no more questions, then we'll thank the speaker once more. <laughs> to invite uh, the next speaker uh, presenting uh, a paper entitled An Ontology-Based Collaborative Development of Domain Information Space for Learning and Scientific Research. And this is a collective work of Anton Anikin, Dmitry Litovkin, Marina Kurtsova, and Elena Sarkisova. We are actually a little bit ahead of time, so uh, we can be a little bit. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Anton Ankin from Robert State Technical University, and um, the topic of my study and uh, of the talk uh, today is ontology basic cooperative development of domain information space for learning and for scientific research. So here so you can see the outline of my talk, and uh, I will show the state of the art and uh, the approach uh, proposed. 
and so on. Uh, information support uh, of research and uh, on the early stages of research process and then uh, as far as for the learning process involves uh, thematic information of retrieval and has uh, some specificities such as, <coughs> such as in the beginning of the retrieval a person cannot realize clearly his information needs and has only general idea to a topic and some uh, keywords so he is not able to create current search query for the search engine uh, to use it to find the resources he is uh, really need. And during the information retrieval, a person can uh, redefine his information needs. So the uh, real um, uh, search query should be redefined to an according uh, to education or research goals. A person has a particular domain viewpoint uh, that also can be different dependent on the on his goals. Uh, so, um, uh, existing approach uh, for the thematic retrieval uh, takes a lot of efforts and not always uh, provides the relevant uh, to the uh, the results that are re relevant to the uh, uh, viewpoint of, of of some domains uh, that the uh, user has. Um, so, for example, the thematic directories and learning resources repositories, uh, as well as uh, open course query approach, um, I was to uh, contain um, uh, many resources in the repository with high relevance to some domain viewpoint, but the stru structure of this uh, repository is given out and reflects the subject domain viewpoint only of some group of experts in some aspects. And uh, granted, creating and updating the collection collection of the information resources requires a lot of effort to, in this approach. Electronic libraries like ACM G um, G Digital Library, EEEE, IEEE e Expert Digital Library and many others uh, contains huge amount of scientific information resources but on the other hand uh, the search result uh, in this uh, li electronic libraries can have uh, insufficient uh, relevance to the domain viewpoint again and this library is not support semantic search of the, sub, uh, of the subject of the domains and semantic web um, approach I was to describe the domain with different viewpoints uh, it's, uh, it's uh, usually difficult to optimize the creation of the domain descriptions with different viewpoints and it's difficult to estimate the relevance of the information resources to some domain viewpoint automatically so the um, uh, task of the information retrieval for um, scientific research on the early stages and, the, uh, and in the education uh, can be used ad hoc object retrieval approach and crash it with uh, uh, features below. So the as input we can get the keyword query that query defines one of some domain concepts. Uh, the query tape is it is the one of the of the four possible um, tape queries. The intention of the query is to find the entities of the particular class in the ontology. Uh, query intent it's it is the class information resource. So uh, as output we will have the, uh, a set of the information resources. Uh, and the, uh, also on the input we have a data grid. So the repository of cognitive and information spaces where the objects and other concepts of the domain and the information resources itself. So as the output we will have a ranked list of information resources and it flashes from, the, from this data graph. Um, uh, so the uh, props is, uh, of this approach is that the main viewpoint is defined by cognitive space of some uh, individual of a uh, group of peoples and the information space contains information resources with high relevance to the some domain viewpoint uh, that is represented by the cognitive space and the cooperative annotating the information resources with some domain viewpoint is possible that is good to uh, good uh, tool from uh, this process uh, on the other hand, the creation of the cognitive information space requires a lot of effort and the uh, cooperative creation of the information space requires judges merging from the other authors of the cognitive and information spaces. Uh, so, uh, a definition of the cognitive space, it is a set of concepts of relations among them held by a human or a group of humans 
So the cognitive space can be individual as well as shared by a group of people. So in our approach, the cognitive space is a set of uh, concepts uh, of the some subject domain for which we um, create in the cognitive space and uh, includes relations, a set of the subsumptions, relations that are uh, defined in the set of the concepts. And the um, information space is a, a set uh, of the objects and relations among them held by information systems. So the information space should be consistent with the cognitive space of a particular human or group of uh, people. And in our approaches, the information space is a set of objects um, of the subject that are held by the information system. Uh, relations between these objects and sets of the reasoning rules for setting the relations uh, between the objects to generate new relations and so on. Mm, so the um, objects include uh, concepts of the subject domain and the information resource of resources of, uh, itself or that set of information resources associated with the concepts of the subject domain. So the relations uh, consist of uh, concept uh, representation relations, a set of uh, associ association uh, relations between the concepts of the subject domain and information resources. Uh, uh, which uh, that uh, allows to uh, set the uh, relevance level of some resources to some uh, concepts of the subject domain and set up the relations between the information resources itself. So the next tasks of for information retrieval using the information space is possible. It's this cognitive information space creating that we uh, concerned with uh, in our um, uh, study and also the information space retrieval from the repository, the concept retrieval from the, from the uh, information space, and the information space navigation to define more exactly the search query, to redefine the query uh, during the redefining the information needs of the subject of the uh, information retrieval process. So here you can see the structures and all the cognitive and information uh, spaces. Um, uh, so the, for, uh, the uh, for formal representation of the cognitive and information spaces we propose to use ontology described with the overall language and the structure of the ontology is present, uh, presented on the slide. So the cognitive and information spaces creating process includes uh, next steps, uh, especially creating cognitive space uh, def that uh, defines concepts and relations uh, between the concepts and as as associates uh, the information resources with the concepts of the subject domain and judges their relevance to the concepts. So the uh, information space on the output is uh, re uh, relevant to the person's cognitive space is created. Uh, so the infor information space can be defined and used uh, the following three techniques or their combinations. Individual creation of the information space, progressive creation of the information space, and creating the information space on the basis of um, existing information space. So we, uh, I will show each of them on the next slide. Uh, so the uh, as the first step, so the person defines a cognitive space uh, that represents his uh, viewpoint uh, for the domain or viewpoint of some group of people. And so here's an example of the cognitive space ontology and small fragment uh, uh, for, program, for programming language C domain. So. Then. Uh, after this, uh, the person uh, defines the information resources and associates it, uh, it with the concepts of the subject domain and judge their re uh, re relevance. Um, so here you can see the algorithm to define the relation between the information resources and the concept. Uh, during uh, collaborative uh, creation of the information space, other persons can extend and redefine the information space by defining uh, then new information resources and relations between the resources and concepts of the current uh, subject um, domain. Uh, so uh, the example on the slide, uh, here is the ontology on, on, on of information space for programming uh, languages C domain, uh, small fragment example again. It shows that two concepts present in book uh, programming can see with different re uh, relevance judges and uh, locations. 
So another way uh, to create information space is creating the information space on the base of exi uh, some existing information space we have. Uh, so at the first step, the person sets uh, correspondences uh, between concepts of uh, two cognitive spaces that corresponds to the information spaces. So the correspondences uh, sets uh, using the scale uh, uh, equivalence or compatible or equivalence, it is equivalent uh, relation between two concepts and compatible less general or, inter or inter intersection relations between two concepts that uh, corresponds to set uh, theoretic uh, relations between classes and relations uh, and at an alignment uh, between ontologies. So after that, the integration mechanism uh, define um, the association some relations between the concepts of new information space and uh, information uh, resources of the existent, uh, first existent information space. So the person can redefine these relations later at any time. So um, here we can see the example of associations of two cognitive spaces. Uh, the example presents that uh, one pair of concepts from different information spaces is equivalent, but other pair is compatible. So here you can see the algorithm to define the relations between the concepts and the information resources um, based on the asso associations of two cognitive spaces. Uh, such was presented on the example on the previous slide. Uh, so, uh, to define the relevant information resources on the step two of the algorithm of, on the previous slide and the relation associates on the step four uh, of the algorithm uh, on the previous slide, the set of the semantic web rules was developed. Uh, we used uh, SRL language, semantic web language uh, to describe it. So, the, uh, here you can see the example of association of two information spaces that was uh, created using the uh, semantic uh, rules uh, from the previous slide based on the uh, two cognitive space associated uh, that was shown two slides ago. Yeah, like this. So, um, Software architecture and two software tools for cooperative development of domain information space was um, developed, uh, designed and developed. And so, uh, cognitive information space editor was implemented as a Java server application, and we have used um, uh, Stardog um, uh, Enterprise RDF um, database that allows to store triplets and also supports uh, the reasoning me mechanism, including SQL rules um, uh, using uh, for reasoning. Uh, it allows to uh, create the cognitive space with, uh, within uh, domains as a set of concepts and relations. On this uh, slide, uh, here is the present uh, concept increment and decrements um, operators, which is kind of concepts, arithmetic operators. And also picture present that is, uh, this concept is described in three information resources with different uh, relevance uh, estimations judges. So, and it uh, also helps to uh, fill the cognitive space with the annotations of the information resources uh, to convert it into information space. So here on this example, you can see that information resource uh, programming C book with um, pages um, in it, uh, which describes some concepts with different relevance judges uh, for the concepts on the left side. So, uh, the second software tool, uh, Personal Collection Builder, was developed that allows to create the personal domain collections that define it as a subset of the elements of the domain information space created by some users. Uh, and it uh, creates it, the collection on the basis of learning profile and annotations of learning uh, resources. Um, for the query, search query, it uses the uh, learning um, objective, objective uh, defined with domain concepts and competences, as well as the current students' competences and uh, knowledge as the requisites um, for the learning resources used. 
the collection is created uh, using the Sphere rules reasoning again, and it is um, visual visualized in three structured form in accordance with the domain structure defined in the domain ontology. Uh, so, developed software tools was, was applied for creation of personal collections for the course programming languages in the Ohio State Technical University. Uh, so, for testing, uh, we have used um, 50 learning resources in the repository. Uh, uh, four tutors take, uh, part, uh, take part in the testing process, and uh, 20 students um, and uh, 20, uh, 20 personal learning collections was created. And the test results uh, has shown that the average time of collection creation decreased almost by 99%. Uh, uh, compare, if compared to the creation uh, collection by hands, automatically generated uh, collection contains all the resources, all, all the learning resources obtained by the intersection of the collections created by tutors for each student, and 91% uh, of uh, learning resources obtained by combining the tutors' collections. And the average value of collection recall increased by 29% uh, uh, and uh, precision by 2.9% uh, and of measure by 60.3% in comparison with non-automated process. So the ontology-based approach to collaborative construction of the domain information space on the base of the cognitive space of uh, individual or group um, and the existing information spaces was proposed. Uh, this approach allows to decrease the time and increase the efficiency of uh, retrieval and uh, reuse of the information resources which are relevant to the subject domain and the cognitive space of the information process uh, subjects uh, and developed mo uh, models, methods and uh, software tools were successfully applied for creation of uh, information space in the form of uh, personal learning collection uh, for the course uh, on the example of, uh, for the course uh, programming languages C++ and Volga State Technical University. And as a user work uh, uh, have stated, the implementation of the cognitive information space retrieval from the repository of the cognitive information spaces, implementation of the concept retrieval from the uh, current information space, and, and the implementation of the information space navigation to define, uh, re redefine uh, the search query as the uh, information needs uh, changes. That's all, any questions? Thank you. I was puzzled, uh, it would make sense also as part of your future work to integrate this functionality with an existing e-learning system that also has other yes. features on Yes, we plan to integrate it with Moodle uh, systems that uh, use, it, uh, use it in our university too. And uh, we seem to develop a plugin for Moodle that will uh, we'll integrate it with this approach. Okay, that sounds exciting. There are no more questions. Uh, then uh, we'll uh, thank the speaker again. And, uh, uh, so we have uh, two short papers scheduled. The first of them uh, being uh, by uh, Peter Dipek, Andrei Lalish, who is the presenter, I believe. Slobodan Stoyic and Vladimir Plos on the challenges of implementation and practical deployment of aviation safety knowledge management software. And once again, we are a little ahead of time, so you can relax now. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Andrei Lalish and I'm here from Czech Technical University in Prague and uh, I would like to tell you something about some real, really uh, practical issues uh, uh, that we have with regard to the implementation of uh, 
knowledge management uh, systems and software in the aviation. I myself am rather an aviation uh, domain expert than really a technical expert, so I will be really practical in this uh, presentation. So uh, first, why we need the uh, knowledge management software or systems in the aviation. Uh, what you can see on this picture is a recent crash landing in uh, Dubai where the Boeing 777 of Emirates Airlines crashed after the landing. Uh, what's so interesting about this picture is that uh, the aircraft involved in this accident was the Boeing 777, which is what we would in the aviation call as the state of the art. It's really a modern aircraft equipped with very advanced technology, um, information systems, uh, and a lot of, lot of equipment you can imagine. Uh, yet, in uh, 2016, uh, this is still possible. This accident happened in August 20, uh, 2016. And uh, what would be the conventional approach is to investigate, to search for the root causes, to search for um, what might be the, the corrective measure, what might be the corrective measures uh, for this case. And while this worked for decades in the aviation, uh, it does not seem to be so uh, effective today. Well, of course, after this accident is investigated, and we know what are the best corrective measures, it will help to improve the aviation safety, but it does not improve the ratio, the accident ratio that we have in the aviation, which is actually on average 10 of such incidents in, or accidents in uh, the commercial aviation. Of course, when we talk about the commercial aviation, in general aviation, there are much more of these. Uh, the problem is that the aviation is very dynamic. We have constantly new technology uh, getting into the industry and uh, when you resolve issues like this, you prevent these, these ones, but they are new to come. And you can either wait for them and learn from them or you can do something to prevent them. And to do something about this means to dig deeper, to go behind the accidents and not to search just uh, backwards what caused them, but rather to search for some patterns that are behind and that need to be formalized and that need to be then tracked actually online in the, in the, in the industry so that the um, actions or decisions can be made well before uh, things like this happen. Uh, that's the reason why we use in the aviation after the year 2000 we have introduced the system, safety management system, which is basically an information system which uh, is supposed to identify hazards. Hazards are basically those patterns that we search for and manage risks. That means to understand uh, how these hazards emerge, evolve and what we can do about them to keep them under control. Uh, to do this, as any other information system, you have to first collect the safety data. Uh, collect and process them. Uh, the safety data, when I talk about safety data nowadays, I mean not just the accidents and incidents, but basically um, any deviations from how the system behaves or how the system behaves from the original design or the original intended behavior. To search for the differences. And uh, then to use the data to drive our decisions, our uh, actions that we take. Uh, this is called the oversight system or safety data driven targeting of oversight system. Um, these two are basically two modules that we use in the aviation. And they are fairly new, uh, so we still quite learn how to build these systems and how to make them work efficiently. Uh, in the aviation, the industry is globalized, so the Boeing 777, which was on the first slide, is used all over the world by many different operators. So it is important to build up a sort of a knowledge management system which can gather the knowledge from all over the world, regardless of which operator or which airline, which airport it is, because the principles are quite the same and all those parties can learn something from uh, what we gather uh, in, the, in the industry. 
So, uh, to have a closer look, what is the reality actually today in Europe? We have a system which is called EKS. Uh, it is a general solution for uh, also other means of transport, not just the aviation. But it's a system, European system, which uh, aims to gather the reports from organizations, uh, organizations like airline, airports, and navigation service providers, maintenance organizations. And uh, they basically report what is stipulated by law because the uh, European Commission has recently uh, progressively applied some regulations which uh, oblige the organizations to report uh, safety critical information. Um, then this information is gathered in the system, which is finally used to derive the knowledge, uh, the so-called safety intelligence, what we would say in the aviation. Uh, the problem with this is that there is quite an imbalance. On the left side, we have thousands of users, which are basically obliged to and have to somehow cope with the mandatory reporting scheme. On the right-hand side, we have just a few aviation authorities which use the system uh, for their rulemaking processes, basically. But there is a significant inefficiency inside because the organizations do not really feel uh, that they should be much proactive with what they do. They're just trying to find out some way how to uh, cope with the leg uh, legislation. And uh, the, the actual derived knowledge on the right hand side uh, is sometimes too general and the organizations are not well encouraged to use it. So this process is not much effective yet. So what we basically need is to have the process of reporting, to have it really easy, uh, so that the, the reporters have uh, time to uh, think about what they want to report, and also, um, uh, but not to spend too much time, of course, because they have to fill in forms which take one hour to fill, they're likely to find, to search for time efficient way how to fill it and just not think much about it. And uh, to produce smart uh, safety intelligence, so smart knowledge which is comprehensible and uh, accepted by the industry backwards so that the industry is actually, would be actually search, in search for uh, such knowledge. To better understand the core of the issue, let's have a look in the ECAS itself. The ECAS, it's, uh, it's a huge system, or, or, or large system with a huge taxonomy behind and a huge uh, structure of, uh, here you can see, uh, attributes uh, which basically comprise some um, reporting form where you can fill in uh, the information uh, about the occurrence in general, that's the top level, then the level below, something about um, aerodrome and navigation service, airspace, um, many different things uh, um, you can fill in, but the most important part is the events, which is also um, they're more in detail, uh, where you basically are supposed to, in this part, you're supposed to describe what happened. Answer such a simple question, what happened? And the structure there allows you to select some events, some descriptive factors, some explanatory factors. You can see that the hierarchy already organized them in some way. There are subjects, there are justifications. For example, if you want to say that um, the weather was the subject, uh, um, that it was, the weather was, say, one of the contributing factors to what happened, then the subject is the weather. Uh, if you want to say that the weather was bad, then you have to go for the justification and select that the weather was bad. And you have to know what is where. Uh, just to have a look uh, into the descriptive factors, if, if we would search for such a simple term as the ATC team briefing, ATC is air traffic control, which are those controllers controlling uh, on the radars, the aircraft as they, as they fly. And if you want to s s file or in the report that this was one of the contributing factors that the briefing that this personnel had before was important, then you have to know that this is actually a descriptive factors, uh, this, sorry, descriptive factor, which is not much intuitive. Uh, then you got into another hierarchy where you have to know that it is under ATM aircraft management, then under the ATC operation room management. You have to know that the room is somehow involved in there, so it's very difficult to find what you're looking for. Of course, you can use the, as an alternative, you can use the full text search, but then you have to know exactly how the term 
looks like because you you have to basic, basically select from terms that are uh, predetermined uh, rather than filling your own so um, this is something that it's not much intuitive even for even for aviation experts and uh, we are currently running a project here uh, together with uh, faculty of Electri electrical engineering where we basically are trying to refine this ah i forgot that this is one of the one of the new approach uh, from the european union to solve this issue because they, they are also aware of the complexity of the system so they develop the so-called smart forms where they give you a set of questions based on which uh, when you um, tick some of them as related to this case for example the first one was an aircraft involved in the occurrence then you are given a set of attributes re related to the to the to the aircraft and not to something else say so there is a basic filter they call it smart forms but here as i said within the project we have we are trying to develop i would say more smart uh, solution which would be ontology based what we did basically is uh, we created conceptual models of how the reality in aviation safety works so we're trying to model the events what are the the actors there what are the situations etc and um, as an example i may uh, show you that the briefing that we searched in the air case would be modeled of course using our own uh, it has some location it has some participants so that actually you can search uh, within the within the terminology um, based on the meaning and not based on how someone else thought that where it should be in, in uh, uh, the hierarchy okay so i hope this is not me who did this we can hear you and now we can see this even better <laughs> okay perfect so um this is the core of the the new solution what we base them uh on the solution is uh our uh smart forms what we may also call it uh it's basically a reporting tool which generates the smart form based on uh, the information that you provide progressively so uh, this one is for runway incursion uh, where you can have three runway intruding objects based on uh, what uh, which one you select you're given another set of attributes that you just uh, fill in so we're trying to make rather some interactive forms um, reporting forms that would be able to uh, not just be easy and time efficient for the user but actually to not to provide so much room for bias because in the ECAS one of the one of the cons that exist there that uh, the, the briefing that I showed you can be there are some alternatives that user may select if he accidentally browses down some other branch and he found something that he fits his expectations so it means that you can have one event described by two persons differently which of course is a problem when you want to derive any knowledge and intelligence out of that so um, this is it and uh, the project has uh, is not finished yet so we hope that at the end the, the smart forms will be accepted by the industry and that it will really provide some some uh, solution that the that the uh, the industry uh, desires. So that's it. Thank you very much. I hope to. Yeah. Thank you, Andre. Questions? So for me, as using these situations, you have been collecting, or you will be collecting, uh, the structured data would it make sense to search for patterns in them uh, that perhaps the experts are not aware of uh, connecting the uh, occurrence of, of a, let's say a collision or a, a, an incident uh, with uh, some predictors which you may not be aware of mm, we think that it will be possible if you have such structured data to find out uh, the patterns which are ob not obvious uh, for the aviation experts that, um, 
they're not visible basically, but uh, we're not that far, we cannot really confirm that uh, this system allows generating such patterns. In principle, it's worth trying. It is worth trying, yes. I personally believe that we will be able to find something like that if the, if the data will be well structured and if we somehow manage to convince the users to use it and if the results will be more consistent than they are today in the ECHA system. What is the size of data that you preview to collect? How many incidents uh, does it uh, include, uh, like very minor incidents, but there are many and uh, your major, uh, what is the size structure? In general, in Czech Republic, for example, there are hundreds of incidents a year. Um, in the European Union, the ECAS, for example, has millions of records. Uh, well, well over, well, over one million, actually, not millions. Uh, but there are, there, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We believe that uh, if the user has better understanding that this leads to something, he may fill in uh, the low level, let's say, and the lower levels we uh, assume are going to be much more robust. So and this is also something that the European Union is trying to do, to convince the users to go deeper, because they, they are usually interested in the top levels, but the users should be in the levels, in the lower levels, and the authorities usually get interested only if the if the user is not able to cope with what he is supposed to cope with. Yes, I hope the answer was clear. Yeah, yes, it was satisfactory. Okay, uh, please go ahead. Uh, so, so, do you have an idea how uh, how well the data in this car system is classified? How well maybe incidents are uh, using these uh, classification categories? Uh, um, I'm not sure how well, but the, um, according to surveys done at the level of European Union, uh, there is a lot of potential which is actually unused. Um, the the ECAS has a lot of functionalities which the users do not use, and as I said, uh, they're likely to find some efficient ways how to fill the reports then to really learn how to how to make the best use of the existing taxonomies, for example, in the ECAS. So I assume that the, there is a lot of room for improvement though. So can you, do you know some number, for example, how what is the average number of classes selected for the tourist for Class, you mean the, the category that you may select for incidents, for example? Yes. For example, you show this um, taxonomy of event types. Yes, I mean, I assume this one. So, yes, there are, um, the whole ECAS has about 4,000 terms, and there are, going, there are definitely more than 1,000 events. Then you can uh, or events and those factors which are uh, below them, uh, or, or sub, as a sub-level, say. And so, if you take uh, the average incident that is reported in the system, how, much, how, how many categories it is assigned? Uh, if you have one incident, uh, one, one incident you can classify only with one uh, yes. category. And you, can, you can say that there was some <coughs> contributing factor before, but that's another classification. You're then saying that there was, it was a chain of events, but if I get you right, uh, you mean how many classifications do they use per one yes. uh, occurrence? Well, you should select just one, but... Uh, in general, there are mandatory fields. They have to select those, of course. And usually, they select, they select only those mandatory fields. That's the most frequent case. I have uh, one more question. So, obviously, you're uh, uh, on par with the state of the art in Europe, uh, as obvious from what you say, but uh, are you aware what uh, a similar landscape is beyond Europe, like uh, America or Asia, do they uh, 
also uh, collect a structured ontological reports of accidents? Is there something you could be inspired from them? We have researched the, the, uh, the other regions of the world. Uh, there are some in initiatives to make a basic classifications, to use some terminology to simplify the process, but we haven't really found anyone else who would be building an ontology-based solution to this very particular issue. I hope this is really the case that we are so, so unique. If there are no more questions, then uh, let me thank you again. And, uh, the last talk in the application session uh, is by Natalie Zhukova, Mikhail Lushno, Vyacheslav Kudashov, Maxim Lapayev, who is the one to present, and uh, Dennis Korobot. And the talk will be on medical knowledge representation for evaluation of patient state using complex indicators. Hello, my name is Maxim and I'm uh, glad to, to present you an investigation on a medical knowledge representation uh, in the task of evaluation of patient state uh, using complex indicators. As you all know, uh, the study of property sense of uh, large uh, systems uh, and uh, phenomena uh, is a complicated process that uh, requires a systemic approach. Uh, one of the such examples is uh, weather forecasting, and as we all know, it's never exact. Uh, the human uh, body system is uh, also a set of uh, interrelating and uh, involved in interaction components uh, that assist each other uh, to get some benefits uh, for the body or for the organism at all. And the point of uh, interest of uh, investigating such complex self-organized systems uh, is to assess uh, the dynamics of uh, health changes and uh, sometimes to predict uh, some worsening or improvement in health. Uh, we were motivated uh, by a couple of factors. Uh, one of the factors is that uh, solving uh, problems of uh, uh, such kind of analysis uh, is related uh, with complicated uh, multidimensional statistics and uh, a lot of uh, methods of optimization. Uh, as for self-organized system, uh, some synergic methods are required. Uh, the tasks of uh, identification of internal links uh, uh, is a time-consuming task and uh, it can't uh, be done by a doctor during a patient visit. I uh, just assume that you come to a doctor uh, to get a treatment for him and he starts calculating statistics. Uh, they would look at least <coughs> here. And uh, furthermore, doctors uh, have around uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, for a patient visit, uh, so it is impossible. Uh, that's why a universal and a visual tool to assess uh, the health dynamics and uh, to solve the tasks of uh, statistical calculations for doctors is required. Uh, the technical background uh, of uh, research and investigation uh, is a well-known and uh, widespread general model. And uh, in the slide I present a general uh, picture of it just uh, to refresh it in mind. A general model is suggested uh, and widely used and uh, it is a de facto standard uh, for data processing. Uh, to complete the investigation and uh, to implement uh, the algorithms, uh, we need to specify the medical processes. Uh, a complex system parameter interaction uh, indicator is used uh, to assess the state of technical systems uh, and the human body would also be considered in a technical system. Actually, it is not, but it is uh, because of a set of interrelating parameters. Uh, and it was also approved uh, by some uh, physiologists uh, that uh, same techniques uh, may be applied for human body. Uh, as it is a combination of uh, interacting parameters uh, assisting each other. Uh, there are many ways to calculate uh, complex indicators uh, of the system. Uh, but we stop on one of them, uh, which is called uh, a coupling of internal interaction indicator. Uh, calculated uh, by the formula in the screen, however, R is a class of uh, non-correlating parameters. 
Uh, the medical data we use uh, for the calculations uh, comes from a uh, few data sources, uh, which include uh, blood analysis, uh, such as lecogram, biochemistry, and uh, all kinds of uh, general analysis uh, when you, what you normally do in the hospital or medical establishment. Our analysis uh, uh, the results of diagnostics by diagnostic devices, such as echocardiography, electrocardiography, as for cardiac diseases. Uh, and uh, basic parameters such as blood pressure, pressure temperature, uh, and so on. Uh, all of uh, these measurements uh, can uh, have a couple of data types. Uh, they can be nominals, uh, they can be interval values uh, from one unit to another uh, when it is visually observed but not measured. Uh, they can be numerates, uh, quantitative and qualitative values. And uh, all of the data types uh, needs its own approach to calculation, the integral uh, complex uh, indicator. Uh, the GDL model uh, specification uh, uh, in details uh, is presented in the slide. And as we know, uh, as you see, uh, the level uh, zero is a pre-processing stage. As we get the raw data and uh, we have to pre-process it uh, to unify the measuring units. Uh, to come to same format of uh, floating point uh, measurements uh, and so on. Uh, the second stage uh, of knowledge acquisition process is level one, uh, which is processing, uh, where we uh, uh, take uh, the time series we got uh, from measuring devices. Uh, we interpolate uh, the results uh, to fill the gaps uh, because uh, sometimes uh, not every value is measured uh, during your analysis. Uh, then we do some uh, correlation estimations uh, and correlation indexes uh, so that uh, we can exclude some too much correlating parameters as uh, they will uh, affect badly the result. As a second level, uh, we start calculation of integral uh, complex indicator. Uh, which includes some statistical uh, calculations, uh, uh, some uh, summations, uh, and uh, finally an internal link calculation. And uh, the level three is actually a level uh, contributed by medical staff, and it's uh, an assessment level. Doctors evaluate the results uh, and uh, assess the health state of the patient. Uh, to complete the task, uh, formalization of processes is required, uh, but not all processes uh, can be formalized. They can be formalized only up to some point. As you can see in the slide, uh, we can formalize uh, the data and algorithms, but not completely. The data can be formalized just to primitive data and complex data types. And algorithm can be formalized just to algorithm groups, uh, because further formalization is impossible uh, without analysis of uh, data state. There is a data state uh, about data type. Uh, data state is something like, uh, for example, we have a data type uh, which is a time series of values, and uh, it can be in different states. Uh, it can have gaps, uh, it can uh, be unnormalized and so on, and that is a data state. Uh, further uh, calculations uh, and formalization is uh, done on the fly uh, at runtime, and it includes uh, input data physics analysis and uh, processing by predefined logical rules. Uh, the general ontology of our uh, semantic medical data analysis system is presented in the slide. Uh, but uh, for uh, the calculation of uh, integral uh, complex indicators, Uh, we use not all ontology, uh, but only part of it. Uh, there is a measurement uh, plus hierarchy in the middle of the ontology, and uh, there is a series ontology to derive uh, the best uh, algorithm and the best service to process uh, the data state uh, by a Spark requirement. Uh, to, uh, to assess and to evaluate uh, the results, uh, we did a case study 
Uh, we analyzed uh, uh, around uh, 100,000 uh, uh, results of uh, labor run of patient of uh, federal cardiac center of St. Petersburg. Uh, the data included uh, analysis results on patient uh, during the uh, year 2014. And uh, we got a depersonified database from the medical research center. And uh, we produced an algorithm to calculate the complex uh, integral, integral, integral indicator uh, based on the labor run results, uh, which includes uh, uh, erythrocytes and the sedimentation rate, uh, erythrocytes, leukocytes, and so on, uh, basic blood parameters, blood cells parameters. Uh, the stages uh, of calculation include obtaining uh, historical measurements of labor run and blood parameters, uh, then unification of measuring units, Analysis of relations between time series using correlation theory. Estimation of correlations uh, between parameters to throw out uh, uh, excessive and uh, two correlating parameters. Uh, removal of redundant parameters based on the correlation analysis. And uh, then uh, we are interpolating uh, the time series to fill the gaps. Uh, and uh, to complete the time series uh, by uh, estimated values. And finally, uh, based uh, on either events uh, during the treatment process, uh, which can include uh, medical manipulations, uh, some drug treatment uh, operations, uh, or uh, based uh, just uh, on uh, fixed periods uh, if no events happen, uh, we partition the time series uh, into clusters and calculate a complex indicator for each cluster. As soon as we have a complex uh, indicator, uh, we can uh, build a dynamics graph uh, by which we can observe the state dynamics uh, without the uh, need of a doctor to look at all uh, these thousands of parameters, but looking just at one complex indicator of the system. And the final stage uh, is uh, visualization of complex indicator dynamics and presenting it to a doctor. As a result, uh, we have a way to assess uh, current patient states and sometimes to predict uh, further changes in state and uh, notify the medical personnel if uh, the patient has uh, downward dynamics, which is uh, of high importance. And uh, at the same time, visualization of patient state dynamics uh, allows uh, assessing efficiency of treatment regime and uh, changing it and uh, making corrections into it. Uh, here uh, uh, in the picture on the slide, uh, you can see a number of uh, blood cell parameters on the left for one patient. And a complex indicator uh, calculated based on uh, this uh, huge number of parameters, uh, which is on the right for patient uh, two. As we see from a complex indicator, uh, the patient had an upward dynamics, and uh, finally uh, his state improved, and uh, the treatment uh, was uh, finished successfully. Uh, the patient is healthy now. Unfortunately, uh, we can see uh, integral indicator for patient one, uh, which, uh, as it turned out to be, finally died, and uh, we see from the complex indicator downward dynamics. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we are presenting uh, some uh, complex integral dynamics uh, uh, for two patients. Uh, these are just screenshots for our uh, system interfaces. Uh, in the upper uh, uh, picture, uh, you can see that uh, patient state finally improved. Uh, and there was some event uh, on uh, the 19th of April, uh, which uh, tended to up down the dynamics, uh, but finally uh, it was corrected. Uh, maybe the treatment regime was changed and the state improved. Uh, in the second graph, uh, uh, we have investigated the events uh, which happened uh, during the treatment process. On the 6th of March, a patient had an operation, and uh, we see a downward dynamics after that. Uh, some blood parameters and the 
complex system uh, state changed. Uh, but after the operation, uh, we see an upload dynamics again. And uh, as we find out, uh, found out the patient uh, finally uh, is okay now and uh, his state improved. Uh, we also tried uh, to find uh, some upload dynamics and uh, unlucky patient uh, whose treatment was not successful. Uh, but uh, as a cardiac center is uh, quite good in uh, curing uh, and treatment of cardiac diseases, uh, we didn't find uh, two clear uh, graphs, uh, but we found two, uh, which uh, show a complete downward dynamics during all treatment processes. And uh, these two patients uh, were unlucky with the treatment too. Uh, so uh, as for now, uh, we have an interface to assess uh, patient state and observe changes in dynamics with a time-consuming uh, thorough analysis of uh, a great number of indicators and parameters of one patient and uh, one diagnostic test. And uh, the interface is available online uh, by the link uh, which you can see in the file and you can try it. As the only problem is that uh, it is not in English yet. We didn't internalize it. <laughs> and uh, we have a couple of plans on further improving uh, of the interface for medical staff, uh, such as better flexibility uh, which includes application of uh, the same method uh, to other body system, but not only blood system. Uh, we want to increase the amount of complex indicators uh, and uh, calculate not only coupling of internal links, uh, but also a number of other uh, complex indicators uh, to present a complete uh, image uh, of the state. Uh, and uh, we are also working on uh, improving the interpolation algorithms uh, so that uh, even if a uh, patient uh, was not uh, analyzed uh, properly every day, uh, we still could complete uh, the full image uh, of uh, our internal body parameter states. Thank you for attention and I will be glad uh, to answer your questions. your last opportunity to ask questions at this conference, I believe. I was wondering, so uh, uh, showing the dynamics of a patient's development uh, is certainly uh, useful. Now, uh, it is, uh, I can imagine that it might be even uh, more informative to show the development uh, of many quantities uh, in one, let's say, visualization, rather yeah. than the diagram of one quantity. But then there's the problem of uh, high dimensionality. And I wonder if you've also considered uh, methods of dimensionality reduction, like uh, P, uh, principal component analysis or multi-dimensional scaling uh, for the visualization purposes. Actually, uh, the aim of a complex uh, indicator is uh, to decrease the dimension uh, from a lot of parameters uh, which doctor uh, just can't analyze uh, during the patient's visit uh, because it's a very time-consuming task. And uh, we just uh, uh, calculate a complex indicator that actually displays a full image and full dynamics of change in the whole system in general. Oh. Oh. Uh, it's for this case a blood system. So it's an attempt uh, to reduce the number of dimensions already. Ah, I see. So no more questions? Then we'll uh, thank the speaker again and just close the session. Okay, so thanks a lot. We are at the very end of our conference. Before we close it, we have one more task ahead, and it's a pleasant task. It's the task of awarding the first prize regarding the best papers here. I could kindly ask also Dmitry to join me, if possible. Uh, thanks, Martin. So basically, three papers were nominated. The nomination, nomination has been done based on the reviews. All of these three papers got excellent reviews 
losing just one point or something like this. So it was really, really good work. And the task was difficult for us because all of these papers was on completely different level of detail and completely different level on completely different problems. So it was really, really difficult. Finally, we decided to award the first prize to the second one. So to the guys who uh, worked on the disambiguation of the author names. So please clap your hands. It's an excellent. <laughs> Um, I would kindly ask the representatives of the, of the authors to join us here. The first prize today is 500 euro to be spent at Springer for uh, books. So I believe that there will be lots of nice books you can buy. Do you already thought about some book you definitely need from Springer? We'll, we'll have the proceedings for the other two authors. First of all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good enough. <laughs> and there's a lot, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so here is the certificate, please. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks a lot once more. And we are at the very end. So um, at the beginning, I started with this slide on Wednesday saying that we traveled from Moscow to Prague in one year and there are other opportunities. So which direction to go is just an open question. And um, as also Dmitry said, it's also up to everyone here to propose a nice location, good location, and uh, it will be a pleasure for everyone to uh, discuss it and try to uh, go, go there. Uh, as for me, I would like to thank everyone for participation. I think it was a really, really nice conference. We had four excellent top-level keynotes. We had very nice and diverse contributions on various topics. Uh, I hope you enjoyed also our social event yesterday. And yeah, that's it. Uh, regarding some uh, after session we will definitely have some emails exchanged regarding the uh, video uh, video recordings and stuff like that so expect some communication on that but yeah you can expect it in one or two weeks approximately so thanks a lot and looking forward for next year dimitri i just want to i just want to say uh, big thanks to peter and all his team because uh, every was recognized perfectly. Uh, we just feel comfortable here and uh, very friendly atmosphere, very nice place, uh, excellent environment. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Safe trip home. Ja, ich habe mich nicht mehr so gut gefühlt. 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 Ich habe mich nic